It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Morgan, Sag Harbor Cinema Board Member and History Professor from NYU, who will moderate the panel. So come on. <laughs> Sit here on the edge. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Look at all of you all. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce, thank you, um, to introduce to you uh, two people who you saw on, on screen and uh, two people who you didn't see but who were all over it. Um, this is Donna Marie Barnes. <laughs> Donna Marie is um, the Director of History and Heritage at Sylvester Manor and the co-director and chair of the Plainsight Project. She's an acclaimed photographer and photo editor, a longtime resident of Sag Harbor, um, and Director of History and Heritage um, of Sylvester Manor, a historic home and farm which you've seen much about, which has as its origins a slave owning, a slave holding provisioning plantation. Donna Marie serves on the steering committee of the Northern Slavery Collective, the Board of Trustees of the Greater Hudson Heritage Network. Network and um, is I'm going to say this like four times because it's written down here and is co-founder of the Plainsight Project. <laughs> um, next we have David Rattree. David is the owner and editor of the East Hampton Star. He is the fifth member of the Rattree family over three generations to serve as editor of the Star. He is also co-director of the Plainsight Project. And in addition to journalism, he holds a background in documentary filmmaking, museum development, and boat building, and holds a degree in anthropology from Dartmouth College. And next, we have Julian Alvarez. Raise your hands. Okay. Um, Julian is a director and cinematographer based in New York City. After falling in love with visual storytelling as an apprentice for National Geographic and the Los Angeles Times photojournalists, Julian went on to a graduate um, degree with a to graduate, excuse me, from a with a BFA from New NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Um, while there, he won 13 achievement awards in cinematography. In his work, he aims to bring documentary and naturalistic sensibilities to his subject. And finally, Sam Hamilton, who is a filmmaker and is also the communications manager here at the Sag Harbor Cinema. Um, he received his BA in film studies from Columbia University and has worked as an assistant editor on projects for HBO, for YouTube Originals, um, for Roku, and for other private clients. Sam directed and edited the cinema's Our Own Main Street Fire, uh, a short documentary chronicling the fire that destroyed the old Sag Harbor Cinema. And since 2021, for those of you who come to the movies, you've seen many of his Sag Harbor stories. Um, an ongoing series of short documentaries fe featuring local individuals here in Sag Harbor. Thank you. Um, I, we're going to have a, we're going to have a, I'm going to have a few questions for the four of you and then we're going to open it up. So if you all have questions that you'd like to ask them, keep them in mind. Um, before we start, I just want to say um, personally that I've just been thrilled to be a part of this project. I think that at a moment when we are seeing the, um, the disregard um, and dismissal and distortion of African American history as um, part of the fodder for right wing political gain. It feels incredibly important to not only tell the histories of the people who lived here, but also to talk about the ways in which the erasure of those histories is actually part of our collective legacy and something that we need to address. Um, so I guess I wanted to start, um, I guess I wanted to start, uh, Donna Marie, with something that you said in the, in the, in your, um, conversation on film. Um, you talked about how important it was to give people a place. 
Um, and I feel like a lot of your work here is about recognizing the importance of place, the the placefulness of Sylvester Manor, but of the lives of these free and enslaved black men and women who were part of the East End. Can you talk a little bit about place? Sure. Is this on? You yeah. can hear me. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much to everybody for coming. This is really pretty extraordinary. Um, uh, when I talk about place and and the importance of recognizing these individuals who lived in this place, it's because so much of the land here on the East End um, shares vestiges of the history and the way that it was. And specifically at Sylvester Manor, because we have this expansive amount of land that is just a small part of what it was originally, but this is still the place where they lived. These are still the woods that they walk through. And so the feeling of being in the same space as these individuals whose names we didn't know, whose stories were not told, is incredibly important to me. And as I walk the grounds, as I photograph on the grounds, it's their memory that I'm evoking. It's, it's, it's seeing it through their eyes that I'm trying to do. And being able to put a name to, to the people that live there, to the, a name to the people who are buried there, has become incredibly important to, to me and to all of us at the manor in how we teach and how we, how we share our stories. So the place, I always, I have a phrase that I use called, the history is held, the memory is held within the landscape. Because the very land itself speaks to us and tells us the stories if you take the time and are quiet enough to really listen and to be able to put their names to it. And specifically with David Hempstead, who is a name that I grew up here in Sag Harbor hearing all the time, knowing you know his history, Hempstead Street, David Hempstead in Eastville and the church, and finding out when I first started working at Sylvester Manor that there was in fact a David Hempstead Sr. and uncovering his story became all the more incredible and important to share. Thank you. Um, I have an, another question that comes for David that comes from something you said on screen. You talked about, I think it was when you were standing at the grave site of Ned and you said um, that understanding what you didn't know made you mad and curious. And I guess I wanted, I, I wanted to hear more about the mad. <laughs> Because I think we see the we see um, the the the, the cu what what has come of the curiosity. But can you talk about that? Ah, that is a really interesting question. Um, it's two levels. One is like as I said in in the film, like you kind of want to be authoritative. Like you run the newspaper, you're supposed to know this stuff. But also the idea that we were told a version of history uh, it can't even really be called history. It was more a, a hero worship, and that that we were essentially sold a bill of goods, not just about the development of East Hampton, um, but really about the development of the country. I mean, we grew up here thinking of the East End of Long Island as sort of this farming, fishing, hard scrabble community. Um, and it wasn't, it was a wealthy community and that wealth was built directly on the backs of enslaved people and indirectly on the backs of enslaved people and the wealth they created in the Sugar Islands. and when you realize you've been BS'd uh, for, or the community has been BS'd since the 19th century when people first started writing down histories, you get a little mad, I, I think. I, 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 yeah, I, I felt cheated and um, probably more embarrassed than anything else, I, I think. Um, but yeah. We get asked all the time when we give talks why didn't I know this? Why wasn't I taught this? And I think in the beginning for David and I, we, we both asked that same question. How come we, we grew up here? How come we didn't know this? History is all around us here. How come we didn't know that David Hempstead of Sag Harbor was actually David Hempstead Jr., just as one example? You know, I don't think we even know the answer yet. You know, five years on in this project, um, it's still not clear to me why why it was omitted i you know i i think some of the sort of abolitionist movement the pre-civil war the division between the north and the south the idea that we had to be the heroes in the north that we couldn't be bad guys like in the south perhaps um 
but I still don't have a grasp of of why it is really that we weren't told. And I think that, I mean, I think that that's certainly a huge part of it, right? The idea that the, that the identity of the story of the civil war is, or the, the, what's at the core there is that the North was against this was, and so therefore it seems impossible um, to, to, you know, as you said, like, I think it, if you asked people on the street, you know, would you, how many, do you think there were a lot of people enslaved out here on the East end? You might have someone say, well, Oh, well maybe a few, but not what it over 300 in East Hampton and over seven almost 800 names that have been discovered so far and that are still being uncovered it's a it's a it's a really significant presence can I ask Sam and Julian if you could talk because I know there'll be there'll be questions about like this the way that there's the film is very beautiful I have to say like the way that you all captured um both the like the um the 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 space of you know of of these communities and the water and the land but also the sort of intimate moments as well but can i ask what you all learned doing this project like what were you surprised uh to to unearth all to hear them talk about what they'd found either one of you <laughs> everything <both>. <laughs> i mean it it's not just people of their generation that have been taught this story. It's people of our generation. I was born here. I was raised here. Same with Julian. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're younger, but we're not, you know, we're not children, but we're still not telling these stories. Mm -hmm. um, so throughout the entire project, it was, it was all an education. Um, and that's why we tried to listen um, as much as we possibly could take guidance from Donna Marie and from David um, because, you know, these stories deserve to be told. It's a story of our community as a whole. Um, and I think uh, for me, at least it, it comes out of the, the work that um, we've been doing at the cinema with these Sag Harbor stories. And the, the small idea with that is to try to elevate, you know, the characters in our town that really make it special and make it unique. And, um, this is sort of a, an extension of that with a much more <laughs> importance uh, historically um, and significance. And it's been a real um, honor for me, I know, to, to be able to help sort of shepherd that story onto the screen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I would hope that everything that people have learned from this documentary, everything inside of it is stuff that I learned as well. Um, I grew up out here and in high school, we were taught a very simple narrative of good guys versus bad guys in civil war, the North versus the South, this fight against slavery and that it would, it's an impossible concept that there would be slaves in the North, let alone in a place like the Hamptons, especially then growing up in the Hamptons and seeing the summer crowds and, and the identity that the East end of Long Island has in our present conscious, it, it's almost impossible to think that there was this forgotten history. But it was it was incredibly humbling, eye-opening that within a matter of 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 minutes with speaking with David and Donna Marie and and on our first day with, with Donna Marie, for example, we were filming in Sylvester Manor and when we went up to the attic, um it it's one thing to hear someone say there were enslaved people here. It's another thing to hear their names. It's another thing to hear information about when they died, what they did. But then it takes on a whole new life when you see carvings in the wall that these young boys made. And that was just one anecdote, one small story out of potentially thousands in a small town that can be applied to the rest of Long Island, the rest of the, of, of the North, the rest of the country. So now that I know it's impossible to, to unsee it and that's not a bad thing at all. Thank you. Um, yeah. Can I ask Donna Marie or David to talk a little bit more about um, the scope of the Plain Sight project, part, maybe parts of of um, the project and where it's going that um, are that maybe were gestured to in the film, um, but or that haven't yet been gestured to. Um, I'll start. Um, I think 
with this project, with working in partnership with the cinema, with the creation of this documentary, with Michael's work, his beautiful paintings um, that we commissioned uh, for this project, that has take, already taken the project to a different level. Having all of you here uh, in this room, that's you know a very special place in, in the lives of us who live here in Santa Harbor and East End, that's already taken it to another level. We are also developing a, a school curriculum for students to, to experience some of this information and the work that we're doing. And so as we get bigger, David and I will, are doing a series of library talks in the next few months. And hopefully this summer we will be back here at the cinema to do another event and throughout the Sag Harbor community. As we get more and more stories, we get more and more excited to share them. Um, and having, having that work replicated in different communities. We have had people come and say to us, uh, we want to do this where we live. And I think if you talk a little bit about Brooklyn. Right. Yeah, so uh, maybe it's probably getting on a year ago, but um, we did a Zoom talk for the Long Island Progressive Coalition, I think it was. Poor People's Campaign, thank you. Um, and there was a guy from Brooklyn who ran a youth group in Brownsville, um, small um, kind of empowerment group, uh, homework help and, and getting kids into college. And he invited us to come speak. And it, it turned out that they were essentially living in, in a community like this, which, is, which was, you know, had an underpinning of slavery. And we ask the question whether our method of looking at, as, as Donna Marie said, you know, the wills and testament, last testaments and account books and old maps and censuses would work. And um, we have been working with these folks to try and figure out who might be buried in this little known African burial ground in East New York. Um, there is a, a Dutch reform church across the street where they have headstones and, and under a branch of the Brooklyn Public Library and a playground was the African burial ground. And our project there with these kids is to do research and try and put names to people who might be buried there. Um, we are really just scratching the surface. We talked about 770 names. We haven't really touched Southampton yet. Right, and just the other day, we we learned about a whole relationship between Gardner's Island and a family that ends up in um, uh, Bridgehampton, the Crook family. I mentioned one of the members is Drusilla, just in passing. Um, but we're, we're, you know, there's this, there's so much more to be told. This entire Long Island's entire landscape, Manhattan, really is a landscape of slavery. The the the, the roads that exist today were walked uh, by enslaved people, were made by enslaved people. The street names here reflect that, the, the enslavers. And um, I think that this question of place, which comes through very strongly in the film, is really important because it, it's not difficult knowing what we know now to sort of walk around with our heads in the 18th century thinking about these individuals. Mariah, uh, for those of you who, who knew the Latham House, um, you know, Mariah was enslaved there until 1811 or 1812 when she was manumitted. Um, you know, all, all of uh, this was probably an enslaver's property at some point. Um, I think that, I mean, the historian and professor in me just has to say something, which is that one, you know, you all talked about Sylvester Manor being a provisioning ground. And what that means is that food was being grown here to be sold to the West Indies, Barbados in particular, but in general, in order to feed enslaved people because they had they had transformed the islands in, into sugar plantations so extensively that they couldn't feed themselves. Um, there wasn't enough land to grow food. And so economically, this region was crucial to, the, um, to sustaining slavery in the sugar islands. So the fact that there would be enslaved people, not just on Shelter Island, but through, because of course, 
with with uh, routes of trade, when a ship is carrying goods from one place to the to the next, it's carrying people as well. And one of the ways in which enslaved people get sold, we think about the Middle Passage, right? That one journey and um, and and landing and 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 being enslaved where you land. But in fact, there's a huge secondary and tertiary slave trade where um, where planters would use the cover of a ship that was going to you know transport um, rum or sugar or to bring back shoes or clothes uh, in order to sell smaller numbers of people um, because that it was a tax situation where you you were um, by if you sent an entire cargo ship of of individuals from Barbados, let's say, to Rhode Island, um, you would be uh, under the gaze of the authorities more intently for tax purposes than if, you know, 10 people were on board that ship with a huge load of, of sugar and rum. So there's there are there are economic ways, there are economic um, connections that explain uh, why there were so many enslaved people here, even as they have been erased. Um, I had one. I'm sorry, I just got lost in my own. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, no, 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 I'm done. Um, I, will, I will say one thing to follow up on that is one didn't have to be a member of the Sylvester family or some large landowner to get a piece of this. If you were a small dirt farmer and you had a bushel of flax, you could get it on a ship in Sag Harbor, have it shipped down to the Sugar Islands, and then be paid on the back end with perhaps directly in sugar or some other form of money generated by the, the you know, as, as I say a lot, sugar was the oil of its day. And it's what created wealth in the Atlantic. It's what really kept this whole chain going. And it is very, just like today, we're all tied to kind of the real estate business here. In those days, we were all tied to slavery. And it, it's really impossible to find, you know, uh, someone who's fishing and, and salting barrels of fish is going to Jamaica to be, be sold on the plantations. So the, the, I think the scale of this is probably what blows my mind frankly. And the other piece of it, which is important, I was thinking about what you're talking about, um, this is a follow the money story. And that, and that's, I think, part of what made me so mad is that we never really looked at the economy and what people were doing here. We just told stories about, you know, someone throwing a pudding at the Redcoats or whatever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe your next film. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think we can open it up to some questions from you all. Okay, and I'm going to, yep. Um, I think I saw first a hand here. And Sam, and thank you so much for the film, you guys. Uh, when you were talking about Barbados, how did most of these people, you mentioned the name Gardner, we all know where Gardner came from, you mentioned the Montaukets, were these people from Barbados, did they come here, the is that where they came from, is that their origin, would you say most of them? Uh, in a lot of cases, yes, specifically those who came originally to Sylvester Manor in 1651, we know that... Uh, when Nathaniel Sylvester died in 1680, he listed 24 enslaved people. We believe he brought specifically from his plantations and the plantations he was partners uh, owning from Barbados. And so there is that direct line. So in the beginning, yes, we think that the majority of enslaved people, African people, were being brought from the Caribbean. Then you see things, uh, letters later on, where someone is writing an acquaintance in um, New York City, some, and and you know asking for a likely black boy, for example. Um, you know, keep your eye out. I'm looking for someone who's honest and and um, so on. Um, by, by 1700, 60% of um, households in New York City and Manhattan um, owned an enslaved person. So there's a there's a vibrant and so, and that's those people are primarily domestic or people who working in households or they are working in trade right and then once you get out of Manhattan and into what's now Brooklyn and Queens in the rural areas uh, those you find pe you find enslaved people who are working you know m more agriculturally as well. Um, I saw a hand back here and then here. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> 
First of all, I want to thank you. This thing was uh, exceeded my expectations, and it was it was a masterpiece from the photography to the narrative to the history. It was really beautifully done, and 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 what I think you've done is you've added another dimension to the concept of examining history and people's culture because you've made them individuals and you've given them that kind of context and that's very strong you know i, I mean history some people think is boring because it's just like learn the facts and not the reasons and so you're bringing us in that direction so hopefully this is an introduction to a long trilogy <laughs> that we're going to go through um, over the next many years so, so thank you for that Thank you, Steve. I do want to ask you one thing. I was not aware that there was a north and south trade route from here to the Bahamas. I always was told that we they came up the the uh, the Gulf Coast through through the um, I'm trying to remember the name of of the uh, current and then across to 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 across the Atlantic and then back down to to the Caribbean by the trade winds. And that was always the th sort of route. So what you're saying is something I've, I had no idea that I ever did. Just just went north to south. Yeah, people do talk about the, uh, the sort of trade triangle, but it's more like, um, oh, I don't know, someone learning to use a yo-yo and it's going every which way. Um, the coastal trade here was very significant. And it does appear that, Sag Harbor's whaling industry kind of grows on the back of the coastal trade. And that coastal trade was about bringing products from New England to the Sugar Islands. That's where the market was. And um, boat building here was not initially about whaling. That, that came later. Uh, people were converting merchant ships that were in, in the coast trade um, and in the Caribbean trade to whalers uh, before the revolution. Okay, I see a hand here. Oh, I'm, oh. Thank you. Yeah, okay. uh, that was really incredible. Thank you, Michael. Beautiful. So I'd always heard that the area outside in East Hampton towards Spring was called Freetown, and it was on the Underground Railroad, and that it was a place where many freed slaves landed and were freed. Um, do you, are you going to expand on that or look into that? I've, it's a fascinating history and. Yes, two things. I'll do the Underground Railroad, you do Freetown. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is how we do. <laughs> so we have heard stories that this area, the East End, Sag Harbor, East Hampton, served as stops on the Underground Railroad. Um, at, the, at this point, th it's really just oral history. We have not found any hard facts about it, which we may never find, because the whole premise of the Underground Railroad was that it was secret. It would be wonderful if we do. However, our point is that there is so much history in the 200, 300 years before the Underground Railroad came into being that we feel is right now more important than learning whether or not uh, you know, someone uh, hid a runaway enslaved person from uh, the South in their corn crib. I'd much rather know that Mariah lived upstairs 200 years before that, um, or 100 years before that, and to know the names of the enslaved people who were already here, who were not running away from something um, and if that turns out to be true, that, that uh, communities here on the East End, houses, individuals did help uh, enslaved people who were seeking their, their freedom, self-emancipating themselves, coming from the South before the Civil War ended, that's a wonderful thing. And that, that makes us all feel really good. However, unless you know the history that comes before it, it doesn't matter how good you feel about the Underground Railroad. Yeah, I, I do second that. I mean, I don't see really 
much in the way of evidence of benevolence. People tended to hold on to their enslaved people here until the last possible minute. And yes, but now as to Freetown, um, Freetown's fascinating and, and it is a truly multi-ethnic community from very early on with um, native people, um, free black people. Um, one of the people who lived there I've always been fascinated with is a black man by the name of Bill Gardner, um, who I suspect was William, who was enslaved on Gardner's Island and then in freedom took the last name Gardner. Um, I would love to find Bill Gardner's descendants living somewhere in the United States or uh, be very exciting. But Freetown is a whole other fascinating story. It could be another, another film. Um, and it was indeed home to a fascinating mixed uh, culture of poor white people, freed blacks and, and Montaukett Indians who lived and worshiped together, which is also a fascinating story. They had a chapel, um, which we're trying to get, uh, if not returned to a public place, at least a marker noting where it was. Okay, I see there and then here. There's another documentary that was presented a couple of years ago at the Southampton Art Museum. It was called Traces of the Trade, and it was by Katrina Brown, Katrina Brown, which tells the story of the North and especially Rhode Island mm -hmm. families that were, and much of this same story mm -hmm. from this East Coast. Mm -hmm. And then here, Eric. Eric. Um, have you uncovered any um, evidence of a slave marketplace on the East End or on Long Island in general? The, the, the answer is no, and I think we probably won't, because in a way what we were talking about before is this, this smaller scale um, trading in human beings that goes, goes on. Um, people are sold in individualized transactions. Um, there doesn't seem to be the sort of stereotypical market where people would come and, and, and bid on a, on, from, you know, from among a group of captive people of African culture. It was conceivable that there would be, but this, you know, this was a fairly dispersed community and, um, Generally, the enslavement here was small, one or two individuals leaving, living in a house. And, but, but one key thing about that is because of the small size of these slaveholding households, um, there was a very strong incentive for children to be sold. Um, so family separation may well have been a bigger factor here than in, in some of the larger places. When one thinks of plantation slavery in the South, yes, there's family separation and all sorts of um, horrible things went on. The horrible things went on here as well. On top of that, more children being sold um, away. Uh, one of the stories that I'm fascinated with is a girl. Uh, oh, you you know, the, the Montaukett boy who's working, he's five. We have a five-year-old black girl who uh, goes to work in East Hampton uh, in 1800, uh, taking care of a baby. Um, I think that the, one of the things about slavery in places like this is, of course, it's like, it's, it, it's not, it's like every day. It, it, in its smallness, maybe you see even more of its cruelty and of it, the saturation, right? So you don't have like a physical place like there is in Charleston and in New Orleans and these physical spaces where you know it was the slave market and that carries a very profound kind of brutality with it. But there's this much smaller thing and I think that you hit exactly on it. Like if you are enslaved on a small plantation, your children are not you know, a small plantation or in a small household, your children um, are not as valuable to the owner to stay. It, it makes more sense for him to sell them off. Um, and chill, And the idea of childhood, of course, when you are putting five-year-olds to work is also really complicated. Um, yeah. Um, just want to thank you. This is great. 
Donna Marie, we're very proud of you. <laughs> we're, this is a Sylvester Manor crew, so we're all very excited. Um, I had a conversation with David last summer where you mentioned there were people who opted out of the slave ownership. So there's a, a sub story of people who said, this is not for us. And, you know, obviously it was very pervasive, the slave ownership, but those stories not as interesting as you know the 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 stories of the poor people who were in the uh, in the in the s servitude side of the equation, but that was a brave thing to do. And what was what was sort of the uh, ramification? Well, of that? I I I think to say it was a brave thing to do is not clear. I mean, what we see is the absence of ownership. In some cases, families do not appear to have been enslavers. Um, cynical journalist that I am, I assume they're either you know, too racist to have these people in the house or perhaps um, didn't have the money. Um, but th th to be fair, that is a question. There are families who, with, you know, we see, we don't see enslavement. Um, you know, what, is, what does that mean? It, it's hard to know yet, I think, that, that we have to dig deeper into correspondence, for example, which is something that we've really, you see a lot in the film of, of correspondence. There's that... Um, the, the Crank's funeral, for example. Um, but correspondence is where you begin to learn about the thinking of individuals, whether enslavers or not enslavers. Um, we know very little, in a way. We know the names now. We know a little bit about generational relationships. But that's a really interesting thing for us to pursue, is why the Domini family, for example, don't appear to be enslavers. And yet, there's a black Domini in one of the censuses i think it's 1810 in east hampton so what you know what's the story there who you know there's, there's so much more yet to learn we have one here and then over here i i really enjoyed your presentation and the thing the thing that it emphasized is my education and what i learned and what i didn't learn and i think of all the millions of, of communities sometimes get exceedingly angry when I hear things like this and see it because it emphasized that slavery is still here and it, and it's still remaining and the thing that disturbs me is that black history is American history it's history that some people don't want to learn but they need to until we recognize that, it's going to remain. And I thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you've uh, been able to be in touch with any descendants of the Hampsteads or anyone, well, I mean, I know it's probably a hard thing to do so long ago, but. Great question, but the answer is not yet. <laughs> we are ever hopeful. Um, we just don't know. Um, the Hempsteads, David Hempstead Jr.'s family, he had one daughter, and she didn't, never married and didn't have children. Uh, David Hempstead Sr.'s uh, additional children who remained on Shelter Island, um, he lost two grandsons in the Civil War, uh, and we just don't know yet whether there are any others, but we are ever hopeful. And the more and more we tell our story, and the more and more that Sam and Julian show the film uh, to more and more people, hopefully someday someone will say, that's my great, great, great grandfather. One, one key on that, while you're going that way, is that we've been working from the past forward in time mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. and and hopefully people doing family genealogies or personal genealogies will begin to sort of dovetail with the work that, that we're doing and and find that Bill Gardner or find that David Hempstead or or some of these last names are very unusual like crook or rug with two G's um, that hopefully and we have a we have two websites you know in the film with you know we're trying to trying to make it um, available in as many channels as we can with, with that. 
both for individuals to learn about their specific history, but as a country to learn about what you're talking about, really that, that there is no separation between black history and American history. It, it, it's all one thing. In the meantime, until we have a definitive descendant group or family or community, we are all, as Michael said in the film, we are the descendants of all of these people that, that shapes our town, our village, our, our area, you know, the east end of Long Island, New York, the United States. We are all their descendants. And so by being here tonight with us, you are all now the descendants of David Hempstead Sr. Very nice. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question over here. Thank you all for this tremendous work. Um, David, you just began to answer part of my question. Um, the form that your project is in right now is all digital. It's on, you said you had two websites. Maybe you could just um, tell us what the websites are. My question, two parts, what, you know, what form is the work in right now and how is it accessible? Uh, any plans for publication of pieces of it? Um, you mentioned some school curricula, et cetera. And you mentioned you're just starting to get into Southampton. Um, any beginnings of stories connecting to Shinnecock that you're already seeing? Um, and fabulous film, and thanks again for your work. <laughs> So a lot of questions. One of the things that we are doing, oh, oh it's a, the two websites is plainsightproject.org and forgetting to remember project.org. We are on Instagram and so on. Um, but we've begun uh, putting brass markers for individuals in East Hampton Village. So we have um, the, the names of several enslaved people. They each get their own brass brick, basically. And then we're installing that in the sidewalk. Um, and yeah, Donna Marie Pickup, I just drew a blank on what I wanted to say, <laughs> darling. <laughs> okay, I got you. Um, where do we go from here and how do we make it bigger? Well, uh, yes, at the moment we do have a digital presence. We will continue to do talks like this. We are going to creep into Southampton. Um, we have a, we're going to do a talk at the Rogers Memorial Library in, in March. And I th suspect as we started when we began this partnership with Sag Harbor, you know, with the Sag Harbor Cinema, and we were planning our 2021 talk here, there was a moment we said to each other, but we don't know anything about Sag Harbor. <laughs> and so as we prepare to go into Southampton for a talk, we will start to look at names, uh, who are the acknowledged family founding fathers, and you start there. And uh, there, the, there the is names are all, one second, the names are all interconnected, <laughs> um, everybody intermarried, and it tends to be the way that the enslaved population spreads as well. Uh, on the Shinnecock uh, connection, there's a story we tell in the exhibit upstairs very briefly, it's about a 1657 arson plot in which a black woman uh, conspired and perhaps paid Shinnecock men to set fire to uh, some of the Howell family uh, barns and buildings. Um, so, you know, this sense, we don't, I don't think we didn't really get into it, but there's a sense of constant resistance as well that you can read between the lines, or in this case, very specific. Um, 1657 is early, you know, but you have a, a, a black enslaved woman plotting with the Shinnecock to, to burn a, a Howell member uh, household. And um, that's, that's significant. It's really significant. So I think we need to wrap things up. 
And I'm going to do two things. First of all, um, I want to thank all of you for being here. Um, I also just want to say that my, my relationship to this project comes via my role as a historian and my um, service on the board of the Sag Harbor Cinema. And I just want to say that it's something um, that I'm incredibly proud of, that the cinema is um, partnering with projects like the Plain Sight Project and trying to create a, a space that really is about more than going to the movies. But having said that, it's a great place to go to the movies yeah. as well. Um, so I just want to say that this is a community theater, right? This is a this is a community based project, and and the fact that we um, have been, have had the the great honor and pleasure of partnering with the Plainsight Project is just um, extraordinary to me. Um, those of you we have a because there's so many of you here. Um, those of you who have a wristband, I hate to say it can please come upstairs to see the opening of the exhibit and to see um, both the work of art that you saw Michael Butler doing in the film and others. Um, and if you don't, and if you can't go up today, please come by again and go upstairs. It's an extraordinary um, collection that also starts on the staircase. So if you're able to take the stairs to go up and see it, um, please join us. So now please join me in thanking um, our wonderful filmmakers, Don Marie Barnes and David Rattree. Woo!